wonderful to see you all. And I am so glad to um, remind you that we had a wonderful reading from this tremendous little book um, written by John Jarvis, who will um, be talking with us today. I'll let Jessica give a formal introduction here in a minute. Um, we have a couple of housekeeping things. The main one is to remind you that we will not be in person on Friday. The last, uh, the final two talks and then the panel of alumni will all be over Zoom and online. So make sure that you work that into your arrangements. Um, and uh, I will pro be providing you with a little bit more information about that final panel, but um, I don't wanna take too much time away from our wonderful speaker today. We are so lucky to have um, insights into the National Park Service on this director. So um, please give him your attention. Three quick reminders for our students and our guests here today. The first one is if you are not talking, please make sure to keep your microphone on mute so we don't hear the doorbell or the dog barking. If you have a working camera and you're able to turn it on, it's lovely to see your beautiful faces as we're here with each other. And then finally, this is being recorded. So anything that you see on the camera or put up in the chat will be in the recording. And um, finally, we will have, have probably about 15 to 20 minutes of um, questions and answers toward the end. This is a really great opportunity for you students ask advice, career advice, job opportunity advice, but also to ask wonderful things like what is the best unknown park in the United States and sort of thing. So I have no doubt that we will have some great questions drawn from both the reading and the neat themes that have woven into the book so far um, this semester. Without any, so put your questions up in the chat and um, as I have done before, I will moderate them after. All right, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jessica to introduce formally our guest. Hello, my name is Jessica Mancha, and I'm an environmental science major here in the spring. And today I have the honor of introducing John Jarvis. John graduated from the College of Williams and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, where John received a degree in biology. John then went on to work to the National Park Service for 40 years. As a ranger biologist and superintendent shortly after graduating, John became a park ranger at the National Mall in Memorial Parks. John served three years as superintendent in Washington State, Mount Rainier's Park, National Park, and also serving as the superintendent of Craters of the Moon National Monument and Wrinkles Lease Park and Preserve in Alaska. John was also regional director who oversaw the Pacific West region including parks in Idaho. In 2009, President Barack Obama nominated John for the 18th Director of the United States National Park Service. Shortly after, John became the 18th Director of the United States National Park Service. Um, retiring from his position, um, John was appointed as the Executive Director of UC Berkeley's Institute, Institute for Parks and People and Diversity. Um, and in 2019, John co-authored a book entitled The Future of Conservation in America, a chart for rough waters in his book, Gary E. McLeese and John used their experiences working in conservation to help guide the vision of conservation. The book highlights the conservation movement and the various challenges the movement will undergo in America in the long and short term, but offers essential and practical tools in advocating for conservation. John has two children whom, is, whom he is very proud of, and his children are active in the on conservation and other issues regarding public health. Today, John is living in California and loves being an active grandparent to his grandchildren. And without further ado, John Jarvis. Uh, thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> and uh, thank you, Emily. And thanks everybody for joining me here this morning. Um, uh, it's a real honor uh, to be with you, and it's an even greater honor to, to present this uh, uh, talk uh, in the recognition of the life's work of John Freemuth, who was a close personal friend of mine, a colleague, a peer, uh, 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 an advisor uh, throughout my career. Um, we miss him dearly, um, but, and I have been there uh, to Boise State a number of times with John. I did a lecture at the Andrus Center um, 
back when I was director. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk for maybe 30 minutes or so, <clears throat> and then uh, love to hear your questions. As I said, I've testified before Congress, so I'm, there are no such thing as a hard question for me. Um, I can, uh, can handle just about anything. So I'm going to switch to my screen share here. <clears throat> And um, <clears throat> I start out just as was mentioned that uh, I launched this new Institute for Parks, People and Biodiversity at the University of California, in many ways inspired by John's work at Boise State um, as, a, as a bridge between the academic world uh, and the practitioner uh, around issues of, of parks and protected areas, both uh, domestically and, and internationally. And, and uh, when this, idea was first being discussed with the University of California, Berkeley, which did not have a center like this. One of the first people I called was, uh, was John Freemuth and, and uh, to get a sense of what it's like to work in, in the academic environment uh, after spending all my career in the, in the policy world. Um, <clears throat> hang on here a second. Got to get it to, uh, to move. Okay, we're having issues right away. Might not be in full screen mode. I, that might be the issue. It could be. Hang on here. Okay, here we go. All right, uh, back up a second. Um, so uh, as you can see from this uh, shot, uh, I knew early on what I wanted to do in my career. Um, and uh, the only thing that really changed is the, uh, the color of the mustache. Um, you can see that flat hat, uh, which I, I've worn for 40 years. I was way ahead of Pharrell on this. Uh, uh, he's a copycat. Uh, you can watch this little TMZ YouTube video if you like to see us have a little debate who had the hat first. Um, <clears throat> and you never know where your career might, uh, might lead you. Uh, as uh, Jessica mentioned, uh, in 2009, I was tapped on the shoulder to go and serve in the two terms of the Obama administration as the director of the National Park Service uh, after serving some 30 years uh, in the agency. So I was a career uh, person in a political uh, position uh, serving in the administration. And in, in that role, you have an opportunity to make some, some real uh, powerful recommendations. Uh, here I am in the Everglades National Park with uh, President Obama, uh, where he delivered his climate change speech, a very seminal uh, discussion about the need to address climate change across all of our, uh, our, our nation, across the world, frankly. Um, and uh, it was an opportunity to uh, show the President uh, Everglades and the work I'm looking at this little alligator thinking that I can pick that up and show it to him. But if you look really closely, there's a secret service guy standing right behind me who would probably tackle me if I tried to pick up that alligator and bring it over to show the president. The concept of park lands and park policy um, has had these sort of seminal moments in its, in its history. And I wanna talk about a couple of those because Dr. Freemuth is a, is a player in that, but Sort of the first big switch was with Starker Leopold. Uh, 1963, University of California, Berkeley professor, science advisor uh, to the Secretary of the Interior and was tasked with really addressing a significant issue at the time, which was the overpopulation of elk in the Grand Teton uh, Yellowstone ecosystem where we had killed off all the wolves and had suppressed the bears and the elk population was exploding. And so uh, Starker was tasked with going out there and figuring this out, but he expanded the, the question and he went beyond that and really wrote this report, which became famously known as the Leopold Report uh, that sort of admon admonished the National Park Service for the way it's been managing and suggested that a new paradigm, one that, that put all the pieces back together and um, allowed natural processes to, to drive the system uh, he coined the term a vignette of primitive America, which is, was, a, was at least something we could visualize, sort of a pre-colonial uh, vision. And he ta said, manage for that. Of course, at the time, climate change was not an issue. And he completely ignored the impact 
and tradition of native people, but still this gave us uh, probably our operating paradigm for the next, the next 50 years or more. And then in 1980, these two uh, documents that came out, uh, one being a Threats to the Park or State of the Parks Report 1980 to Congress and John Freeman's book, Islands Under Siege, uh, 1980, 1981, uh, really triggered the Park Service to think about threats, uh, to think about them both internal in terms of its own operational uh, uh, threats, as well as external threats like clean air, clean water, uh, boundary issues and the like. And John's work uh, was a seminal trigger document in the National Park Service for me particularly and many of my colleagues to really begin to address uh, these issues in a robust way. And John you know, in his book characterized these external threats as in, resulted from ineffective legislation, inept ep implementation, and the potent political power of pro-development forces. And all of those issues are still in play, probably even more intently in the last four years, but are still there. And um, as was mentioned, I was I went to uh, Craters of the Moon. It was my first uh, superintendent. See, I was 39 years old. I had the goal of becoming a superintendent by the time I was 40 and I got Craters. And uh, being there in Idaho and with John not far away, I asked him to come over and serve on the board of directors of the Cooperating Association. So I got to see John a lot uh, while uh, I was at Craters and we really built a fantastic relationship. Um, and it, it was really in many ways through John's work and and my sort of worldview was that there's a lot of negative out there. There's an awful lot of things that I think all of you as uh, students that are interested in conservation that can drive you nuts and depress you and make you feel like, uh, you know, as, as Starker's dad said, to be a biologist is to walk in the world of wounds, um, that we see these things. But I'm gonna, in this talk, talk about success stories uh, because when you devote a career to this work, when you apply science, when you really apply what we wrote about in the book, strategic intent, you can have very successful conservation uh, goals and you can see them uh, come to completion. And I'm gonna talk about those, uh, not that there, any of them were easy and not that I did any of these on my own by a long shot, it was always a teamwork. And I had some sometimes a major, sometimes a minor role in all of these, but they're worth talk, stories to be told. And I'm gonna run through a bunch of them just to, uh, to get the, stimulate the conversation as well. So really one of the biggest ones that really came out of the Leopold Report in many ways was return of natural processes, return fire uh, to these, these fire dependent ecosystems. And, uh, and really started in Sequoia National Park and has expanded through many of our parks. It's something that we need to do a whole lot more of um, but at least we understand now that these ecosystems must burn. They're gonna burn and better that we burn them under conditions that we can at least somewhat manage rather than they burn under extraordinary wildfires as we have seen uh, in, uh, in much of the world today. And in some par national parks, like in this case, the Illouette Basin in Yosemite, where we have been doing this for over 40 years, we are now well-documented in the positive ecological benefits, everything from water storage to biodiversity uh, to complex systems as a result of fire continually burning in this one area where we have not suppressed uh, fires and has resulted in, in a, great, uh, a great complex ecosystem as well. The returning of top line predators uh, in 1995, we captured wolves in Canada and released them into the Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, highly controversial, uh, but frankly, quite successful. Um, uh, depending on your perspective, of course. Um, but uh, the wolves have become extremely popular. Uh, they have established their habitat um, and their range. They have expanded well beyond Yellowstone into Idaho, Oregon, and other parts of the West. Um, still very controversial, as you can imagine, uh, from uh, the ranching community and others. Uh, but nevertheless, they have had a very positive ecological benefit uh, on the Yellowstone Grand Teton ecosystem in terms of that predator prey a relationship. A more complicated issue with wolves is Isle Royal National Park, uh, where uh, this study of, of predator prey, moose, wolves has been going on for one of the longest 
uh, scientific studies uh, in, uh, in conservation. And, but we were realizing that we got down to just a few wolves. Um, they, uh, there, there've been a number of tragedies uh, associated with them. And with climate change, the lake system was not freezing as frequently. And so there was not any movement of wolves back into the population. And so we had to go through a long complicated process of making a decision of whether or not to augment uh, the biological genetic uh, diversity of the wolf population. And that happened on my watch as the director uh, and ultimately we made the decision uh, to bring more wolves back into Isle Royal uh, to sort of assist migration, as you might say, which is a, a totally new kind of uh, way of thinking of, of parks. Back in the Yellowstone ecosystem, uh, the way we've managed grizzly bears has changed significantly in, over the years, uh, closing the bear dumps and, and stopping the, the artificial feeding, sort of weaning them of that. Uh, and then protecting them extensively, at least within the, the park uh, and in the adjacent lands through the Endangered Species Act. Um, they have recovered, uh, I think, biologically, the habitat and the population is stable. Um, again, controversially uh, in terms of whether or not to delist, uh, but uh, the bears are doing pretty well. Uh, this particular one, 399, has a Facebook site if you want to check her out. Um, she's very popular. Uh, in the Grand Teton area uh, as well, but another uh, conservation success story. The California condor, uh, the condor decision uh, is very famous in the world of endangered species in that the decision was made to round up all the remaining live condors in the wild and go to captive breeding. Um, and uh, this particular shot is at Pinnacles National Park in, in California, uh, where captive breeding has been quite successful uh, with the California condor, and we now have condors reestablished in the wild in California and Arizona and a few other uh, places of the West. Extraordinary bird. Um, and uh, they're not off out of the woods yet, uh, but uh, we, there are at least hundreds of them now uh, back in the wild and an opportunity to see them uh, in the wild. Um, Channel Islands National Park, uh, our Galapagos uh, in many ways. Uh, an extraordinary uh, set of, of islands off the coast of California um, with uh, their own set of uh, endemic species uh, that have developed over thousands of years of isolation from the mainland. Um, and we uh, manage these islands uh, in partnership with the, the Nature Conservancy. Um, and, uh, but there is a, uh, there's a darker history uh, to these islands. They were privately owned and run as cattle ranches and sheep ranches for many years. And during that period, uh, a number of exotic species were uh, introduced. Pigs, rats, sheep, cattle, elk, turkeys, Argentine uh, ants, did I mention rats, uh, and, uh, and fennel. Um, and so we, when we got these things, they were overrun with, uh, with exotic species. Um, and in order to really recover the island so that the, the native endemic species could really thrive, particularly the island fox, we had to kill things. Um, and so we began uh, a process of removals. Uh, we hauled the sheep and the cattle off the island. Uh, we shot the elk. Um, we shot the pig, the turkeys. Um, we poisoned the rats. Uh, and um, we trapped the pigs. Um, we thought we had 3,000, that was the estimate, and we caught and killed 5,050 pigs uh, uh, over a period of, of a couple of years um, with uh, the assistance of the Nature Conservancy. Um, you, you can't kill things without creating controversy. Um, and so here is the uh, Channel Islands Hall of Shame. Now that's me about uh, third way down of the page, the superintendent above me. Um, the Nature Conservancy had uh, uh, Steve McCormick and uh, the local congresswoman and others all uh, uh, pillared for, their, uh, for our work to, uh, to uh, clean up the islands. We could have never done it without great science and understanding. This is a young scientist working with the Channel Island Fox um, to understand uh, their uh, vulnerability. We had to round up all the foxes and put them into captivity uh, for captive breeding during the 
process of killing off uh, the exotics. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention also um, golden eagles had gotten on the island and they, they like to eat uh, foxes. And foxes had grown up without eagles, so they didn't look up. Um, and so they were pretty vulnerable uh, to, uh, to predation by, uh, by the eagles. Uh, these little guys are really cute. They're about the size of a house cat um, and they're completely unafraid of you. Um, so if you get over there now, uh, you almost guarantee that you will see, uh, uh, see island foxes. Um, and it was resulted in the, the, the fastest recovery of an endangered species in the history of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, and it was resulted in a team effort, National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the Nature Conservancy, um, and others all working together. This is uh, them being recognized for the teamwork of, of recovering uh, the island fox and restoring the Channel Islands uh, as well. This is Point Reyes National Seashore on the coast of California, just about an hour and a half uh, from, um, uh, from San Francisco. Uh, this is a, a large estuary called Drake's Estero. And within it, uh, there was a uh, oyster farm uh, that predated the park. The park uh, bought it um, completely uh, with the full intent of shutting it down uh, because this estuary was the, is the pupping uh, area for harbor seals. It's, a, it's an extraordinary resource of seagrass beds and, and seabirds. It's refuge for the harbor seals from the, the um, great white sharks, which roam outside. And, um, and uh, we've fought the, well, the owner said he wasn't going to leave. Uh, we had a huge legal fight. We went all the way to the Supreme Court, which we won. Um, and uh, we removed 1,700 tons of oyster racks treated material uh, in, the, in the estuary. And, and as a result now, the harbor seals can uh, pup in that uh, area uh, free from disturbance by the, by the uh, oyster farmers. Everglades National Park. Uh, this is more of an ecosystem scale conservation effort, uh, really because the Army Corps of Engineers in the state of Florida attempted to drain the Everglades for decades and decades and decades, we resulted in extraordinary loss of habitat. 80% of the birds had gone into to decline. Um, and, and a big reason was the way that, that ecologically it had pre-operated, uh, and that was essentially the, uh, the Lake Okeechobee, which is sort of center on the left slide, um, would overflow from uh, floodwaters, rainwaters, uh, and flow down through the Everglades. And then the Corps came in and diverted those to both the Gulf and to the uh, Atlantic. And we've been working ever since to restore those flows, both in terms of timing, quantity, and quality of water back into the Everglades in order to restore it. And the biggest accomplishment that we did in the uh, Obama administration was to build a bridge um, to allow passive flow of water back into the glades. You can see in the slide with the big, uh, channel of water, that's the Tamiami Trail, which is a highway, which has basically formed a berm across the top of the Everglades. And uh, all that water, you can see how wet it is on the right and dry it is on the left. Really by elevating the Tamiami Trail and allowing that water to flow through, we made a major accomplishment on restoration of the Everglades. Still a lot of work to be done, but it's, it's on the right path. And a little closer to home uh, in uh, Washington State, Olympic National Park, the Elwha River, um, this river, uh, which uh, originates in Olympic National Park, flows out to the Strait of Juan de Fuca, um, had been dammed in two large hydroelectric dams uh, and uh, also providing potable water systems uh, 100 years ago uh, and had blocked all upstream anadromous fisheries, steelhead and salmon. And this is a project I personally worked on for 20 years. Um, and uh, in 2016, we uh, accomplish the final uh, component of dam removals. Uh, this is the Elwha Dam. This is the Glines Canyon Dam, which is upstream from there um, and completely removed. And you can see the uh, Lake Aldwell, which was behind the Glines Dam, is now returning to its traditional um, river system. And this is another one that where science, uh, driven uh, by Brian Winter, who was our chief scientist during this process, and the tribes, uh, Robert Ellison, 
uh, was the tribal lead for the lower Elwha Clinellum tribe, uh, incredibly smart, powerful political uh, group to help us achieve this politically uh, in what time, sometimes a hostile environment. We had to get 13 consecutive individual appropriations through Congress uh, for a net result of $350 million uh, to remove these dams and put uh, nature back together, but uh, an extraordinary accomplishment. Within weeks of taking the old oil dam uh, lines down, steelhead were at the top of the watershed. I wanna also mention um, the role that Native Americans have played and, and need to play in a much greater role in the management of these parks and a recognition that we need to place with traditional ecological knowledge alongside Western science. Um, they've been around a long time, they're still here. Uh, they're deeply devoted to conservation uh, of their traditional lands and it's an area that uh, really needs a great uh, deal of additional work and it's something that I've worked on much of my career. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about large landscapes. Uh, this is Mount Rainier National Park where I was the park superintendent. You can see these wonderful ecological boundaries there on the north and the, and the west, uh, just straight lines drawn with a ruler. Um, and, uh, and what that looks like is interesting because you can still see them from space. Uh, if you look closely, that uh, line on the left, the line on the top is actually because all the lands around it have been clear cut. Um, and uh, only the natural forest is left in the park. And that has long-term ecological you know, uh, consequences at the, at the landscape scale. So we have begun starting in 91, really in the Yellowstone ecosystem, uh, how to think and operate and manage at the, at the landscape scale. And even, you know, Yellowstone and Grand Teton are big, but they're not big enough and they have to be considered within this much greater ecosystem. In this case, you have Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, you have forest service lands, you have working ranches, you have communities, you have uh, Indian reservations. I mean, you have all this stuff mixed in there and figuring out how to do this effectively, I think is the sort of new direction for conservation and something that certainly Dr. Freemuth uh, challenged us all to work on and think uh, about how we would do this. And, and there are really powerful consequences of, the, of being able to do that here in the case of the the pronghorn antelope uh, and establishing the pathway of the pronghorn, which summer ranges in the Tetons and winter ranges down in, in Wyoming, uh, really had to figure out how to let them traverse this gauntlet of, of fences and power lines and highways and private lands and dogs and everything else. And how you do that in a way without being big government uh, is, is really critical uh, of being able to sit down uh, across the table with a cup of coffee with the locals and figure that out and work on the benefit. And this has been done and it's an area that we could, uh, we certainly need to continue to expand on. And it isn't just domestic. We can also do this internationally. Um, and there are uh, huge opportunities to work with Canada and Mexico uh, on very large landscapes uh, that can preserve uh, these species. Of course, it's being a bit challenged on the Mexican border these days, but, uh, but still lots of opportunity. And it's an area that, that we worked extensively on. This is at the Wild Nine Conference in Mexico where uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the US Forest Service, uh, Parks Canada, uh, CONAMP, which is the Mexican uh, National Park System got together, signed an agreement for cooperation across borders for migratory species, everything from monarch butterflies uh, to, uh, to large mammals. And that same group got together um, in 2016 and figured out uh, how well the United States, Canada and Mexico, the North American continent is doing against the uh, conservation of biodiversity goals, which were set uh, in Aichi, Japan, that each nation would commit to protecting 17% of its terrestrial environment um, and 10% uh, of its marine environment. So how good are we doing? We're about 12% um, for North America. It's the, only, it's the only continent scale analysis that has been done. Uh, we looked at all uh, protected lands, uh, that would be state parks, wilderness areas, uh, you know, large landscape areas of the BLM, uh, private lands, 
um, uh, anything that was had any type of legal protection uh, to come up with this analysis. Of course, we anticipate that the next Convention of Biodiversity, which is going to be in China next spring, will set the goal at 30%. Um, and hopefully, uh, with the Biden administration, uh, we will commit in the United States to achieve that 30%. The governor of California, Governor Newsom, has committed the state of California to the 30 by 30 goals, 30% of the terrestrial environment in protected status by 2030. And so one of the very interesting questions out there is if we're at 12% and we gotta to get to 30%, what land should be in some form of conservation and for what reasons and what values are we trying to accomplish? And co certainly conservation biodiversity is one of those, but also large landscape connectivity, climate change adaptation, uh, access, recreation, um, equitable access for communities that are disenfranchised from the environment, urban parks, um, watersheds, all of those things need to be considered, uh, and working landscapes. Uh, we should not exclude working lands from that discussion about keeping them working, working forests, agricultural lands, but managed for uh, some aspect of conservation contribution as a part of that. Now, of course, we have uh, some new drivers, uh, climate change. This is uh, some scientific work done by Dr. Patrick Gonzalez, uh, who is a principal author in the IPCC report, also the, an adjunct professor here at University of California, Berkeley, and the chief scientist for climate in the National Park Service. He has noted that the uh, climate change is happening even more quickly in the national parks, principally because they are already in extreme environments, high altitude, desert, others, but temperature rise is even greater in, in these uh, national park lands. And we can see uh, you know, poor glacier becomes the, the poster child of climate change in the national park system uh, with its uh, receding glaciers. We'll have a new naming contest someday to decide what, since it can't be Glacier National Park, it'll have to be formerly known as Glacier National Park or Glaciated National Park or something like that. But uh, we, we won't have any glaciers. Um, and that has all kinds of downstream consequences, of course, uh, to the environment. I mentioned earlier that the, that, that Starker Leopold's Leopold report um, sort of challenged us to, to recreate the scene, you know, of native species of wild animals in their abundance, and that protection alone would not be adequate to achieve that goal, that it, it basically told, he told us to, to be active management. Um, and we've done that for, as I've indicated, we've been doing this for the last 40 or 50 years and, and folks like John Freemuth and others have supported that work um, extensively. But in, uh, when I became director, I recognized that um, the Leopold Report was lacking at least in terms of its direction for us in light of climate change. And so, um, I commissioned a group of scientists, two Nobel laureates, uh, led by uh, Dr. Rita Caldwell, the former head of the National Science Foundation, extraordinary individuals, uh, to revisit the Leopold Report and give me uh, and the National Park Service a new goal. And this one is frankly less clear, uh, more challenging to sort of envision, but recognizing that, that the national parks are are and should be a core of a larger land and seascape and that we need to preserve ecological integrity um, and, and, and steward this for continuous change because we, are, we can't hold them static. We have to be managing for that change and at the same time use those lands to inspire a new generation uh, to, um, through these sort of transformative experiences as well. Um, I wanna mention a couple of other things that I think are really important to know. One is that this movement to recognize the health benefits of being in nature is, is quite extraordinary. It comes out of uh, my friends in Australia uh, in the park system down there who really pioneered this idea of the park prescription where doctors literally are prescribing the outdoors for everything from heart disease to depression to cancer. And it has really taken off here in America um, and there are a number of groups that are adopting this concept. And it's been particularly interesting in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, where 
we're beginning to better understand how parks need to be managed in a slightly different way in order to accommodate the interests of people going into the outdoors while at the same time dealing with a, a highly contagious uh, disease vector like uh, COVID-19. And so you see this uh, recreate responsibly um, activity coming out of, out of uh, the outdoor retail industry, uh, you know, the Black Diamonds and REIs and others that are really pushing this idea in partnership with the National Park Service. And then a lot of new information around social distancing and how to participate uh, in outdoor activities while at the same time protecting yourself um, as well. And it's, it's been fun to see, uh, you know, sort of getting into uh, the activity by uh, our very many creative people uh, in the National Park Service and around us as partners that have jumped in to help the public understand how they really should uh, participate in the outdoors, uh, which has been a high desire, frankly, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but we may need to do it. What's interesting as a park manager is to think about this and, you, you, you know, when, when I go to a national park, you know, it's a busman's holiday, of course, I'm looking at what the problems are, um, and I'm now looking at them slightly differently. One is that by design, we aggregate the people. We aggregate them into parking lots. We force them through a, a funnel point, like a trailhead, because we want them to read the sign that has the, you know, look out for bears, safety information. We get them to register on a register book. So they all go to the register book. Uh, they go to the visitor center. Uh, they go to the backcountry office. And so our entire operation is built around pushing people together. And we need some rethinking around that uh, in order to, uh, to uh, provide for the required social distancing, things like multiple entry points, one-way trails, timed entry, reservation systems, all of those are sort of in play right now. And we're a bunch of us are sort of collecting a lot of that stuff for, uh, for best practices to share amongst the, the park community. I wanna mention uh, a product of, of my institute, and this is the Park Stewardship Forum. Um, it's a free online publication um, designed to bridge between the scientific community and the field practitioner. Um, you can go to my website. Uh, you can see it up there, parksberkeley.edu PSF, uh, and get to this. You can also get to it through the George Wright Society. Uh, this is a partnership between uh, the University of California and the George Wright Society. Uh, we have uh, issues out on climate change. We have an issue out on, on uh, environmental education. Uh, we have one on marine conservation. And in January, we will be releasing a new issue on the role of parks and public health, uh, led by an extremely uh, talented group of, of doctors uh, who are working in the field of prescribing nature. So take a look at this, completely free. Also think about it as a place that you could publish. Um, we do both peer reviewed journal articles and we do lay articles. We also do poetry if you're interested and we can embed video, it's completely online. So we can do just about anything. It can be as long as we want. Um, so I consider that uh, as a possible future place, place your, your interest articles uh, as well. And then as both Emily and, and, and Jessica mentioned, uh, uh, this little book uh, was an effort by Dr. Gary Macklis and I to sort of capture uh, both our experiences uh, as uh, working in the administration, but also to lay out a, a framework for the future of conservation uh, with a number of elements. And a lot of those elements, I will again uh, say that uh, Dr. Freemuth was a key to a lot of that. He thought a lot of this and he was always willing to reach across the aisle uh, and, and seek positive solutions uh, to compl complicated conservation issues uh, in our country. So uh, many uh, ways it's a tribute to him. And with that, I will stop there and see if you would like to uh, talk about some questions. Wonderful. Well, please join me either silently or unmuted in thanking John for that wonderful overview of this, the, the an enormous profile of successes that the National Park Service has had. There has been a very active chat. There are lots of questions, but I think an appropriate starting place would be the question that um, uh, Alyssa 
Zepeda asked about this sort of process of establishing new parks. And this goes in line with the 30 by 30 um, proposal, but is also sort of a historical retrospective. So Alyssa, would you like to ask your question for us, please? Sure. Um, so I was interested in knowing the process or an overview of what the steps are to establishing a national park. And um, in a case where the government wishes to establish a national park in an area where other people have already established their use on it, um, what would the, that case be? That's a great question. Um, so um, there are two ways that uh, new units of the national park system can be established. Uh, one is through Congress, um, <clears throat> and that is a, a bill is introduced by a member of Congress, goes through uh, committee hearings, uh, it refers to the full uh, House and Senate. If it passes, then it goes to the president and is signed by the president of the United States. And that is, that is the most traditional way that they have been established. Um, the second way, is uh, through pure presidential power under the Antiquities Act. All presidents since Teddy Roosevelt have had the authority, uh, unilateral executive power authority uh, to designate national monuments, which uh, not national parks, but they are, they are uh, protected areas under the administration generally of the National Park Service. Sometimes they are granted to other land management agencies. They can only do that on lands that the federal government owns. Um, and so they can't do it on private land. And if there are already private activities inside, um, then they are at least an attempt to accommodate that. In some cases, though, there is an acquisition of those lands by the federal government um, using the Land and Water Conservation Fund. But what's interesting, and I'll just mention this, that the classic American idea of national parks like Yellowstone Yosemite, which is an exclusive federally owned, nobody lives inside except rangers, visitors come and go, is a model that hasn't worked around the world. Uh, when you take that model, I like to say, we originated the idea, we shot it around the world. When it came back, it was different. And that was because in many other nations around the world, there are indigenous people or others that live on these lands and removal, which we did with Native Americans, just doesn't work. Um, and so they've had to figure out and adapt the model to support and incorporate Native people uh, in, those, uh, in those areas uh, as part of the park, part of the stewardship. And we, we, probably the place we did this the best was in Alaska in the park units that were established in 1980 uh, under, uh, under a law passed by and signed by Jimmy Carter um, that um, it accommodated the native Alaskans for all their subsistence activities. But the bottom line is parks get established by either Congress or the president. Thank you. I think we'll take that last point and go to Daniel's question about cultural heritage and resources. So um, maybe we can follow up on that, that um, last point about um, the inclusion of, of pre-existing populations in the park. Daniel, can you ask your question? Sure. Um, a lot has been done to uh, preserve and, as you said, uh, recreate the scene as viewed by the first Europeans. Um, that scene included at the time the native peoples. Has there been effort to uh, recreate um, any of that through archeology span or uh, involvement with the tribal uh, associations? It's a great question, Daniel. Um, yes, but in a, I think increasingly probably a more respectful way, um, you know, in the, 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 the park service portfolio, the inventory of total park units more than half are of historical nature or archeological places like Mesa Verde uh, that are part of the park system. And they preserve these Native American sites. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I think that the United States has generally viewed Native Americans as something of the past rather than contemporary Native Americans who are still here, still traditionally associated with these lands and places. And increasingly in the National Park Service, we have reached out to those. And rather than us telling their story, inviting them to come to the parks and tell their own story, uh, 
uh, it, it, not only to the public, but also for the, the understanding, the traditional ecological knowledge, as well as the cultural preservation of important sites. The next phase, in my view, which other nations have done better, like Parks Canada has, like Nahani National Park, which is completely run by First Nations, is that we have not achieved yet where true co-management, true management of a protected area by the native people. We came very, very close with Bears Ears National Monument in Utah uh, under the Obama administration was designated as a national monument uh, by the president. Uh, and the five affiliated tribes there were essentially the managers under that, the way it was structured. The federal agencies were in sort of the background uh, to that. It was all unwound, of course, by President Trump. Uh, but uh, I think that, that we will see more and more of this where we are um, empowering the Native Americans here in, in the United States to, uh, to uh, take on the responsibilities of management of some of their traditional lands um, and do it in a, in a uh, respectful way uh, as well. Fantastic, thank you. So I think we'll um, take Aaron's question about science and then we'll do some channel islands and wolves because there's some pockets of questions on both of those. So Aaron, please. Uh, yeah, so actually just yesterday, a deal was reached among the, the different interest groups to remove the four dams on the Klamath River. Uh, I think it still needs to be approved by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, but in your book, you discuss the problem of scientific ignorance. And I think you give the example of evolution. Has this kind of ignorance gotten any worse in recent decades, or is it just more apparent now that we have to rely on science so heavily to solve things like climate change? And then how does that play into garnering support for things like dam removal? So, um, well, that's a complicated question, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I do think that it's gotten harder. Um, it, certainly in this last <clears throat> few years, we've seen uh, attack on science at a level that I don't think I've ever experienced. I mean, there's always been skepticism about evolution and things like that, but, but really attack on science and scientists uh, that are not in alignment with certain political views. Uh, I read an article in the New York Times this week where uh, a doctor uh, or nurse was treating people in one particular state that we all mentioned uh, who were, were terribly sick with COVID-19 uh, who refused to believe that they were sick with that. They, they said they were sick with something else because COVID was not real. Um, and, uh, and the nurse said the only way you could get them to shut up was to in intubate them uh, when they were complaining that they were not sick of COVID. Um, so there is a anti-science uh, movement out there that, that does run afoul of these issues. And, and uh, when you're taking on something like a dam removal, which you know, putting nature back together is complicated. Uh, when you know, the removal of the Elwha dams, you know, that was potable water to the city of Port Angeles. It was water to the, the pulp paper mill and the water had to be a certain quality. Uh, the river floods, uh, there, there's the genetics of the, of the fisheries. There are you know, hatchery fish mixed in there with wild fish. Um, there's a water quality issues, quantity, uh, you know, subsurface you know, infiltration. I mean, you just, oh man, it's just uh, a lot of stuff that had to be figured out with the best available sound science, as I like to say, and that's it in the book, uh, you're never gonna have perfect science. And you have to apply that alongside politics, public engagement, traditional knowledge, economics, jobs, all of those things to pull off a large scale ecological restoration like the three dam the four dams on the Klamath, uh, which is so are sorely needed uh, as well. And that, that'll be a huge accomplishment. Um, if they can pull that off. So um, I think that Stephanie and Eli had some questions about dams. So I think we'll sit on that and see if they have any follow-ups here to what you've already said, John. And then and then we'll go to Channel Islands and Bulls. Stephanie or Eli, did you have anything that you wanted to add about the Elwha or other logistical questions?
Yeah, I was just curious. Um, I guess, like you said, that it took uh, what twenty four years from when the Elwa project started until it was completed. Um, you did mention that there were some holdups in, uh, like, c Congress. Um, were there also complications from like more local, uh, like local pushback? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it actually took thirty years. Um, I only was involved for about 20 plus of those, um, but it really started well over 30 years ago. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, uh, interestingly, um, so as I mentioned that the dams had a, uh, an intake valve that ran water to the city of Port Angeles, which is a, you know, small, relatively small community, uh, kind of timber based, uh, tourism economy. And, um, they, uh, <clears throat> they got that water out of the river um, and with only treatment, the only treatment was, uh, it was chlorinated. Water was that clean because it was coming out of the park um, in completely protected environment. And so they got a waiver from EPA uh, for uh, treatment of the water for anything other than chlorine. But once we took the dams down, that waiver was no longer good and the, and the, the um, the city needed uh, a water treatment plant. And so we had to build it. The park service had to build it for the city of Port Angeles. It was a $5 million project. Um, and so we built it for them completely, paid for it completely. And under the agreement, operated it for five years. And then at the end of five years, we were gonna give it to them. So it was basically a gift to the city. And the city refused to take it. Um, and uh, in a very funny uh, sort of experience, um, the, uh, the local congressman, uh, Norm Dix, uh, who at the time was the chairman of appropriations, very powerful, very, very powerful congressman, and I uh, were driving over there to meet with the city council uh, to force them to take this gift of a $5 million brand new facility that we ran for five years. All they got to do is run it. They just got to hire a couple of staff to operate it, but they wouldn't gonna do it. And uh, Congressman Dix, uh, you know, he's, he's sitting beside me in the car and I'm driving and he says, you'd think if you bought somebody a car, you, they would be willing to put gas in it themselves. Um, and so he got on the phone and he called every member of that city council on the way there and told them that if they didn't vote in favor of this uh, acceptance, that he would never give them another GD dime as long as he was in Congress would come to that town. And so he called every one of them. And so we arrived at the city council meeting and they surprisingly unanimously voted to, uh, to accept the, uh, the, uh, the treatment plant. And then and everybody got up and spoke very positively about their relationship with Congressman Dix and this great project of restoring the Elwha Dam. And then and the last guy I spoke said, and by the way, who gave Congressman all of our cell phone numbers? <laughs> um, but it was that kind of local sort of active engagement, regardless of the science and the positive benefits of just sort of getting this thing done uh, that we had to hammer out. And I think that's gonna be the case of any of these, these kinds of big restoration projects. Thank you. Matt, you had a couple of follow-ups and you were predict, you were curious whether there would be, whether there will be more removals. Do you wanna follow up with anything more? I think that's a no. Oh, go ahead, Matt. Yeah. I think, I think he covered it with what he was saying. I was just, I mean, I had the same question. Um, but I was just curious if, if you thought any other dams would, would be closing down or. Yeah, I, I will respond to that, Matt. Um, yeah, I do think so. There's been some effort on the Penobscot River uh, up in Maine, runs mm -hmm. uh, out from Baxter to the ocean, of uh, some dam removals. What's interesting is that there's an infrastructure out there in America on rivers that are getting up against their, their age limits. They're, uh, these, one of the most significant factors on these two dams on the Elwha is that they were quite old. 
and they were going to need significant investment for restoration. And so you could, you have a choice, you can restore them or you can remove them. And I think we're going to be facing that across the nation with a lot of these aging dams that are problematic and, uh, and the, the forces will push at least some of them uh, to be removed uh, and the river systems restored. We've heard a good bit about the lower, the four dams on the lower snake as well, mm -hmm. sort of regionally um, for some of the same reasons. Yeah. Right. So let's turn a little bit to critters then. And Alyssa Molis had a question about the Channel Islands um, restoration. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about how like um, the, like killing all those animals and stuff was like, unethical and really controversial did you like do anything to like kind of work with people and like kind of make it more ethical like relocating elk or like selling the meat or something just to make it not seem as bad i don't know yes um they uh, we really didn't want to shoot the elk um and we worked really really hard with cow fish and game uh to see if they would accept them uh for relocation uh but they ultimately decided no because of concerns for uh, chronic wasting disease, uh, that not that it was in the population, but the concern by introducing a new population of elk into an existing population of elk, that there was the potential for disease transmission. Um, for the pigs, uh, we brought over a group of chefs uh, to see if the meat was, uh, uh, was um, palatable. Um, and they determined because the pigs had fed so extensively on the wild fennel, and fennel is a key to licorice, that the meat was pretty unpalatable. Um, and so it really wasn't an opportunity there. In some other parks uh, where we have done uh, culling, um, uh, we definitely uh, provide the meat uh, to uh, shelters, uh, the bison meat and coming out of Yellowstone uh, goes to Native Americans um, and elk as well. Um, but in the case of the Channel Islands, there really wasn't an opportunity. I mean, the cattle and sheep were were moved by boat and returned to the mainland. Um, but uh, everything else, uh, unfortunately, was shot um, as well. We were sued in the middle of it uh, by... Um, some animal rights groups, um, but they were unsuccessful in stopping the action. So it was, it was controversial, and it it can be uh, a painful uh, to sort of be at the front of that kind of activity. But the the end goal was was important in this case. One of my favorite authors, T. C. Boyle, has a trilogy of books about that project. I'd be curious to hear at some point what your <laughs> thoughts okay. on his his novels all are, but they're really compelling characters on all sides. Yeah, and I know all those characters. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine. <laughs> I imagine you do. Yeah. Wonderful. So um, Alyssa Wolf had some questions, and a couple other people had follow up on the wolf reintroduction in Yellowstone. So I'll go ahead and call on those students. Yeah, I was wondering um, if you could expand more on the benefits um, that occurred from the Yellowstone wolf reintroduction um, that it had on the surrounding ecosystems and regions. You kind of mentioned that um, the wolves were able to expand out into you know the other states and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, one of the most significant consequences, of course, is that um, with a, a, a predator population like wolves, uh, they impact elk in a, in a variety of ways. Um, prior to the introduction of wolves back into the ecosystem, um, there were significant components of the Yellowstone forest, particularly um, the aspen forest that were just not regenerating. Um, uh, you know, aspens grow as sprouts uh, from root uh, spread and they were all being uh, browsed uh, right down to the ground. And so there was really no reprod reproduction occurring uh, in these aspen groves and the, the, the older ones were getting decadent. And so we were facing probably a significant potential loss of that. <clears throat> and in many cases, these are in riparian zones and those trees provide shade 
uh, to uh, aquatic systems um, that then, you know, uh, host a, a, a range of aquatic species, fish included. Um, by bringing wolves back into the system, one thing it does is it keeps the elk on the move. Uh, they don't just blaze around in one area until they eat it down to the nubbins. Uh, they have to move. And so it distributes the elk uh, more evenly across the larger ecosystem as the, as the wolves pursue them. And it does, does have an impact on the, the overall population uh, of elk uh, as well. Um, and then there's, you know, all the subservient predators and they're, you know, when the wolves are gone, the coyotes were top dog uh, in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And, you know, they have a different impact on the ecosystem than wolves do. And once the wolves came in, they, you know, they took down the coyotes as, as, uh, as top dog. And, uh, uh, and that had its own sort of cascading effects into the, into the ecosystem as well. So, you know, there's still a subject of quite a bit of study uh, about uh, what these long-term consequences are. Um, but um, what's interesting about that is that, you know, the Park Service general policy is to, you know, restore these systems back to some, some assemblage of, of a natural um, abundance. And the only way you can do that is to put all the parks back. Eli, I think your question is a bit of a follow-up um, regarding the social impacts of the reintroduction of wolves sort of beyond the ecological systems. Can you ask that one for us? Yeah, um, so I was just kind of wondering <clears throat> uh, some of the, the social issues that have kind of arisen since the reintroduction of wolves, maybe um, that has to do more with humans. Like I know herders have a lot of issues with the reintroduction. So it's maybe something along that lines that you're aware of. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, the, the community that uh, uses uh, public lands for grazing um, are definitely concerned about the wolves and loss uh, of, of their flock um, or cattle or calving. Um, what's been interesting to me is that that the number of advocacy groups that have supported the, the wolf populations, uh, the wolf reintroduction have figured out how to sit down and work with um, these uh, local ranchers and grazers to figure out how to live with wolves. Um, it's not an either or, uh, it is that they are there now. And it's, uh, you know, for a while it was the uh, uh, shoot, shovel and shut up uh, approach to, to wolves, um, where you shot them when you saw them and you buried them and you didn't talk about it. Um, and to where we can figure out how to live with them. And it's interesting, I was up in the uh, Northern Rockies section near Glacier and, and talking to some ranchers um, when I was director. And uh, interestingly, they had figured out uh, through a lot of experimentation that wolves do not like those sort of fluttering flags you see around used car lots, uh, you know, with a little triangular flag on a rope and it flaps in the wind. Um, wolves don't like that um, and are, will not cross it. And so if they put those kinds of uh, corrals around their um, pregnant female cows uh, and confine them, they can have their calves just fine and, uh, and with no loss. Now this is, requires people to change their, their, what they've been doing for you know, 50, 75 years. But it's a recognition that we're all in this together. And you know, in many ways, that's kind of the core of what Gary and I talk about in our book is that it can't be us versus them. It can't be, um, you know, it's gotta, we gotta work this out together. And up in the, up in the Bitterroot uh, area, uh, they used to say, well, you know, we had disagreements, but we all went down to Trixie's and worked it out. And Trixie's is this dive bar on the middle of nowhere where they all go in and had a couple of beers and a greasy hamburger and sort of hammered out the things that you can agree on. Um, and, and I think that to me is really the key to conservation in the West, particularly, uh, is finding common ground between the traditional you know, users of the public lands like grazers and hunters and fishermen uh, and the conservation community and the public land agencies is to, is to find a way to work together uh, towards a common goal. Because 
I think at the core, everybody loves these places and wants them to be taken care of. Uh, they just have slightly different views of what that means. And, um, and entering into those kinds of discussions respectfully uh, with everybody's opinion honored uh, and then and look for where you can, you can work together. And I, there are some really good examples of where that's, that's actually working. Wonderful, thank you. So I have a question that I'm going to insert here about the sort of branding of national parks. Because by one interpretation, the National Park Service has been not just the most successful land management agency in the US, but the, the one in the world, right? The hats all signify that there's a park ranger there to help you, right? The signage out front tells you that you have arrived, right? The maps have a black band on the top. I've collected all of mine since I could drive, right? And all of these are sort of symbols that attribute to the success of the National Park Service. I'm curious what the future of that, that brand could be or should be um, for the questions of equity that you talked about, but also sort of this international piece. What are the pieces of that that could work um, in other contexts as well? Well, first of all, you're, you're absolutely right. The brand is, is very strong, uh, highly respected worldwide uh, and viewed very positively. Um, I, prior to COVID, I spent a number of uh, trips in China, um, uh, helping them establish a national park system. And, um, you know, they're now over 200 nations that have national park systems. Um, it's a mixed bag, uh, but they all look to the U.S. as their sort of role model um, for uh, its management policies and its branding. And um, when we were working to lead up to the National Park Service Centennial, uh, we worked with one of these Madison Avenue kind of marketing firms, and they uh, they affectionately called the Arrowhead the Flint. Uh, and uh, but they said that it is uh, they researched it, and it's. Uh, you know, it's up there with the Nike swoosh or any of these others, you know, it's a super high quality brand. <clears throat> so I think what the future to me uh, for the national park system is one is that there are gaps in the system, um, particularly in the recognition of the contributions of women and minorities. And it's an area I spent a lot of my time as director adding new units on the historical side uh, places like Belmont Paul, Women's Equality, Harriet Tubman, Colonel Charles Young, Buffalo Soldiers, Cesar Chavez, um, Stonewall Inn uh, in New York City, the sort of major site of the LGBTQ movement, uh, and a number of civil rights sites down in the South, like Birmingham, uh, Freedom Riders, uh, and others. That So in, in, in my view, the National Park Service has a responsibility to both protect these places that, that represent the best of the nation, both ecologically and culturally, and to tell their story in the ecological natural reserve systems that we manage. I see them uh, increasingly viewed as the core of a larger landscape and the park services role is to help facilitate, uh, but not own, uh, these lands outside and work across multiple jurisdictions and boundaries and build that expertise within the park system and sort of bring that brand to the table uh, to offer the, the sort of, you know, public recognition and respect of that brand to an effort to protect a larger, a larger ecosystem. And then on the historical side is to authentically tell these stories so that the nation can deal with things like the Civil War, uh, institutional racism, um, civil rights, uh, and, and respect for all people of all cultures and nature and religions and beliefs and, and ethnicities. Uh, I believe the Park Service has a significant role in using the power of that brand uh, to help the nation achieve its very highest ideals as articulated in the constitution. Wonderfully said, thank you for that. I have a essay written in my head, these students have heard a portion of it about the Latino influences to Aldo Leopold that have been mm. unrecognized maybe a future park stewardship 
um, Institute forum, but <laughs> but that's a that's certainly a piece there. I wanted to see if Mackenzie had a question or if there were other questions that were lingering. We have maybe time for one or two more questions. Sure. I was this is sort of related to national parks, but more just on the broader topic of protected areas. Um, you were referencing the Convention for Biological Diversity um, goal of 12 or 17 percent terrestrial protected areas. Um, my understanding is that that measurement doesn't include multiple use areas. So do you think they should be included or especially when you're thinking of connectivity or um, that those definitions are appropriately narrow? Well, the, the CBD goal includes the five categories under IUCN uh, mm -hmm. of protected areas and of which uh, one of those categories is a multiple use um, protected area where there can still be traditional activities. I mean, you think about the European parks in Italy or, or France, they are, they are working landscapes. There are still uh, farmers in there, there are you know, uh, traditional um, activities and they are still considered national parks or protected areas. So I, I think we have to include them. Um, you know, there's certainly gonna be some areas that are not eligible, uh, you know, industrialized, you know, mining, you know, those kinds of extractive activities are really inappropriate uh, within the protected area community. But I do think we have to figure out how to do better with, you know, working lands uh, and, um, and, in, and also communities that are inside of these boundaries uh, and, uh, and developing their stewardship. I mentioned I was in China, uh, you know, working on an evaluation of one of their premier new national parks. It's uh, San John Wien. Uh, it's up on the uh, Tibetan Plateau. And um, it's uh, an extraordinary area, uh, immense. And it has a, a population of, of Tibetan uh, yak herders. And um, they serve as stewards. They are, uh, they are uh, considered rangers. Um, and they are paid uh, to protect the lands that they have protected for thousands of years. And so figuring out how to do that uh, in, in a very effective way, I think is the key to the, the concept of, of protected areas uh, around the world um, uh, under, the, under the Convention of Biodiversity. Thank, thank you. All right, well, um, Stephanie, why don't you go ahead and ask your question about park visits and then we'll conclude with that. Yeah, I'm just curious. Uh, I just looked online and it says that the National Parks website says there are 422 National Park sites. Um, have you visited all of them and what are some of your favorites that you have? Uh, no, I have not visited them all. Uh, there are people that have though. There's a, a, there's a little club uh, of people that uh, show up and, uh, you know, and says that, you know, they got to get their last one. <clears throat> we keep adding them and it's annoying to those people that we keep adding them. Um, <clears throat> uh, I've been to probably 200, 250 uh, of the 400. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was director, I could never say which one were my favorites, of course. Uh, love all my children. But uh, they, uh, you know, I spent five years in the bush of Alaska at Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve. Uh, it's, um, it's the Pleistocene um, right after the glaciers uh, left. An extraordinary wild place. And, you know, if you're, uh, if you're the adventurous type, it's, uh, it's a great, great experience. Go there, drive out to McCarthy and walk on top of a glacier and look out for bears. Um, and um, definitely... And, and also in Alaska, of course, Denali and Katmai uh, are two of my favorites uh, as well. Katmai being, you can go to Brooks Falls and see bears there gathering in the fall, fattening up on salmon. In the, in the lower 48, uh, in, I, 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 I tend to lean more towards the lesser knowns, the ones that are you know, really wild and, and still uh, not overly developed. Uh, North Cascades National Park. I served as the park biologist there for five years. And it's a, it's a little piece of Alaska in the lower 48, mm -hmm. surrounded by wilderness areas that probably that area, if you count all the wilderness areas, it's close to 10 million acres uh, that, is, that is just wild rivers and big mountains, you, you know, big mountains to climb and 
places you can really get lost uh, in it um, as well. I love the Southwest, uh, the Canyonlands, Arches, uh, Bryce, that whole, you know, uh, incredible uh, Red Rock country is fantastic slot canyons and places to, to get out and, and see the night sky. Uh, and of course, you're in California to get up into the high Sierras, um, you know, to in Sequoia or, or Yosemite and spend the night is, is, is right up there. And then, you know, in the, in the historical, you know, uh, places like uh, Mesa Verde um, to, to really, or Chaco, uh, to really spend a little time out there in these incredible places uh, that were so important to the ancient Pueblo and people uh, and are still really, really important culturally uh, to, uh, to Native Americans. And then, you know, very powerful historical sites uh, you know, the Civil War battlefields, Gettysburg, Antietam, Manassas, um, and then the Civil War sites, I mean, the Civil Rights sites, uh, you know, you can, you can go to the 18th Street Baptist Church where the four little girls were killed uh, by the Birmingham, uh, Birmingham period, or the bus station where the Freedom Riders were attacked by the KKK, that bus station still exists. Uh, you can go inside and stand there and, you know, uh, and think about what it would have been like uh, in that in that period. Um, so, uh, all Everglades, you know, go to the Everglades and wade out into that water, you know, right up to your thighs with alligators nearby, and and uh, you know, experience the the river of grass. Um, it's all worth it. All great. So, an endless year, you know, life opportunity to visit all 422. I think you've just given everyone an itinerary. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Wonderful. Well, please join me once again in thanking John Jarvis for being here with us today and giving us such a wonderful overview of the National Park Service and all of its many successes. We appreciate your time and really all of your insight into these issues. They've put such a nice exclamation mark on so many of the themes we've talked about, whether wildlife restoration and ecosystem and scientific insight into the parks, as well as some of the social context for it. So thank you so much for that. I know a lot of students have to run off to other classes and work in internships and things, but maybe we'll stick around for a few minutes in case there are some lingering questions that didn't quite